Cass Torres is a 53 year old New Yorker. And in 2015, he went to the StoryCorps booth to share his story about Heart Island. Heart Island is an island about a mile off of New York City, and it is the largest potter's field, the largest cemetery in our country, where people largely unnamed and unclaimed and penniless are buried. And some of you may have heard it, even though he recorded it in 2015, it just aired recently on public radio because Heart Island is in the process this year of being transferred from the Department of Corrections to the Parks Department in New York City. So this island for the majority of its last 150 years has had a lot of different uses. It was the original place where black Union soldiers were, were trained during the Civil War. And then it became a prison for Confederate soldiers and it was a cemetery for the same. It's been a, how, a place that prisoners have been housed and juvenile offenders and alcoholics and the criminally insane, people with TB, and it's been a place where military operations have been staged through the years. And all of that time, it's been a prison. And it's also been a cemetery where these million people have been buried by prisoners. So it's been a place that's been off limits for people from New York. They weren't able to go there. If they did have family, they weren't able to memorialize them until now when it's being reopened. So Cass Torres went because he wanted to remember these folks and he wanted to um, pay tribute to them, but he couldn't do that without telling his story, which he did kind of in very simple and clear cut language. And he said, um, when I was growing up, my mother um, was an alcoholic and she couldn't take care of us. So he lived in a variety of juvenile institutions. And then the day after his mother died, um, he got picked up by the police for selling pot, but they found the funeral card in his pocket, so they let him go. Then a couple of years later, when he was a late teenager, he was arrested again for robbery, and that's how he went to Rikers Island, where the cemetery is. And he talked about how at the start, he was on the cemetery crew, that it was his job to bury bodies. And he talked about how he saw things that no one really should see that even thinking about it now, it's hard for him to make sense of it. But like you said, there are things that the public is just not aware of that go on. And he said it never broke him, but he got to the edge sometimes. And that was in particular um, when he had to bury the babies. He had to handle their bodies and to bury them. And he said he really couldn't make sense of it. And even now it's hard to deal with the memory. So, we try to make sense of that story, right? I mean, my guess is maybe all of us know someone who struggled with alcoholism and how deep that can be in a person, like almost in their DNA. I think of a woman I knew, she was beautiful and amazing and she had three small children and she had everything to live for, plenty. And she just couldn't put the bottle down. She literally drank herself to death like before she was 40. Right? And you think about a woman like Kaz Torres' mother, who would have had all of these issues of racism and generational poverty in a world without the right resources for such treatment. And you kind of understand how a kid could grow up in a family with a mother who couldn't care for him. But then you try to think, how did this society get to be this way? right, where we take children who've been abandoned and neglected by their family. And then we have so underfunded institutions that they, at their best, just continue to abandon and neglect these young people. And then we have these young people go to prison and become the person burying the children who've been abandoned and neglected. I mean, it's hard really to make sense of that, isn't it? Paul uses a word that I don't use very often, which is unusual since I'm a pastor, and the word is sin. I tend to use words like brokenness and abuse or neglect or sadness, right? But Paul uses the word sin, and it's a way of saying there is just something in our DNA that is just deeply broken, right? It's, it's in all of us, and it's around all of us. It's in, as he says, in the very course of the world. Something in us. Like, you have to ask. We 
we have more nuclear weapons in the middle of this state, they can blow up the whole world a few times, right, Right. We've got so much surplus military equipment that our police departments now look like occupying forces. And yet somehow we can't figure out a way to just fund, um, to just fund the system, right? To just fund where kids can be taken care of. But that's not the main word in the Apostle Paul, because before we could just completely despair, we're reminded, as Brandon said, that what's the bigger word than sin? Grace. That's like if you're at the Royals game and ask you, here's the question, you're on the Jumbotron, what's the biggest word in Christianity? Grace, right? That is the absolute biggest word. It's a way of saying that every single thing comes to us as a gift, as a complete gift that is unearned, the unconditional love of God. I mean, it's what we knew when we got out of bed this morning, right? The vault of sky, the air we breathe, the beat of our heart. We didn't make this or earn this or deserve this. You know, the baby that we've had at our breast, right? The child in our arms the feeling of a lover's hand in yours, your mother and your father, your child, all of this comes to us as a complete total gift. And more than that, the chance to start over, the second chance, the chance, the third chance, the chance to begin again, all of it is grace and gift that comes to us beyond what we have done or what we have accomplished. And then out of that, Paul goes on to say, we live out of our good works. It's not like we sin and we do good things, so we'll be loved. Huh? There's this brokenness, but there's so much love. And out of that overwhelming love, we can't help but pour out ourselves. And then Paul goes on to say, but remember, remember that you were at one point cast aside, lost, afraid, alone. Remember the worst moment in your life, right? <laughs> and out of that moment, live with incredible love. And that's what Cass Torres could also talk about too. Because when he came out of that prison, out of a life in which he'd never had a community that had cared for him, there was this community in New York City, this not-for-profit called the Fortune Society, which was started after an off-Broadway play with a similar name in 1967, really shone a light on conditions in prison. And almost 55 years later, this not-for-profit in New York City has been building people and not prisons with these incredible wraparound services, like a quilt around someone that realizes you need love, don't you? You need a place to stay. You need a safe place. And you need someone who believes in you. And you need training. And you need a place to pour your life out. And you need health care. All of the, And over these 55 years, they've helped tens of thousands of people like Kaz Torres, who now, 20 years sober, father of two, works there as well, helping people come out of incarceration into new life. He's not the only one. I mean, his story is sort of the story core of our faith, right? Brokenness and grace and this good work that can come out of it and all the time remembering, right? Remembering that hurt and how it can use you to fuel people. Richard Sanders could talk about that too. You might have seen his story as well. In the last eight years, he has made a couple of hundred quilts for people who've been pushed aside like veterans and the elderly. And now he's a part of a team of seven that have set a goal of making a quilt for every child in foster care down in Texas County, Missouri. There's 80 kids down there that they're making these quilts for. Not just any quilt, but a quilt exactly for that child, individualized. And they say sometimes it's kind of heartbreaking because the child was one or two and they put their little name on there and try to imagine what the child would like, which is not that hard for this group because they're not the usual quilting bee. They're members of a prison there and they spend five days a week 
eight hours a day at the quilting machine. They're making one right now for an 18 year old who's about to pass out of the system. And he spent over a hundred hours on this quilt. It's got beautiful velour around the edge. He spent all these times on the geometric designs. And then he's got this grizzly bear kind of looking out of a window as a way of saying to this young man, there's the world, go take it. And these men talk about what this group has meant to them, right? How it's reminded them they're human when their heart breaks over the baby quilt, right? Um, it reminds them they're human because they care for one. It reminds them they're human because they see that quilt completed, stretched out. They imagine the knitted hat that's gonna go with it and the toiletries and the school supplies that the other prisoners have brought together. And they send that out thinking and praying and hoping for some new life for this child. I, for some reason, have used a lot of prisoners in my years as a pastor as illustrations. Maybe it's because Paul was a prisoner. Maybe it's because Jesus had a special concern. Maybe it's because of the insight and the power and the hope that I see there in people in such tough situations that remind me how my life could be a similar story core. Just this week, I um, met with maybe three or four different guys in the church. And um, one of them was incarcerated at a time. The other two or three, no, they were in college and graduate school, places where men more of our stature would expect to be. All of those guys, every one of them, a gift to me, every one of them creative and smart and intelligent and passionate and attractive and a good father and a devoted community member. And every one of them in different ways concerned about, you know, their own brokenness and their own lack and their own felt failings and their own, every one of them kind of struggling with that list of stuff that they were just sure was wrong with them. You know, why is it, right? And that's why we need each other so much to remind us because sometimes we don't remember well, sometimes for some reason, the stuff in our back that was painful, it's just right there in front of us. Sometimes the mistakes we've made, they're so large. And so we need one another, right? To kind of wrap that quilt around us, to help us remember well that the final word isn't, brokenness or the hurt or the mistakes, but this God whose love just finally can't be stopped. Just finally, he's just so present to us, so available to us every moment. So my prayer for you is that you might imagine all these brave, strong people who get up this morning looking out from their window, imagining the world out there how it might love them, how they might love it back. Amen. Amen.